my career is my identity. One thing that I loved about working at Shopify is I discovered professional coaching. I don't like gender deterministic statements. So I don't like saying that like women are better leaders. I never wanted to run my own business. I feel like if I can inspire one young woman, maybe I'm doing my job and that's it. So Arti, let's talk about your childhood. What was your journey like as being an immigrant in Canada and growing up? I, I believe your parents immigrated from India. Yeah, they did. My dad came here when he was 16 in the 70s when I think Canada was really different. He had an older brother here that was here. So there was like a little bit of a path carved out, but he was really young. He went to school like in the night and... He worked during the day and he has those like typical Indian immigrant stories of like the snow was up to my waist and <laughs> I would take the bus everywhere and it was freezing. But he has a little bit of a unique journey because he came here so young. And so he feels like he was, he's more from here than he's in, from India, to be honest. He's just progressive in general. And so I think going to high school here, uh, working here with so many non-Indians, I think he kind of found his home. So that's my dad. And how was little Arti while growing up? I'm having like lots of feelings when, well, you know, we talk about there, we were talking about therapy before, but I was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 37. So last year. Okay. And so I'm reflecting a lot on little Arti recently, especially in therapy, which is like, what did she need? But she was very creative. She's still very creative. She was very creative. She was very artsy. She was always drawing and coloring and um, she was always making things. She was very crafty. Like I was like a big craft person. I still am. That's like the best part. I have a four and a half year old. And that's yeah. literally the best part about having a child right now is like all <laughs> I plan are these like elaborate crafts. Yeah, she was very crafty. Thanks for sharing about the ADHD diagnosis how so you said you're reflecting a lot about it by going back to your childhood is there anything you want to talk about that yeah i mean i think there's i good and bad of the internet and good and bad of like instagram pop psychology is um i'll, I'll tell you the story of the adhd it's like very it's very funny so i I think I always suspected I had ADHD and I think in university even I tried Adderall, but instead of writing my essay, I ended up cleaning my office for like ever. And I was like, maybe this isn't going to work for me. But I always felt like when there was a moment of, I had figured everything out. I had a system. I was like very rigid with the system. Any time there was like, one more thing added to it or a moment of like too much unstructure that's when like things fell apart right that's when like you know the organization system I had built fell apart like I'll give you an example of like going into that art school it's like managing like that arts and creative side and being so hyper focused but still having to do like regular high school I think I struggled with that I think in university that moment of like no one's telling you where to be and you get to choose that was a little bit challenging and then the next moment where I realized, okay, this is a pattern. Now I want to go get diagnosed. And then all my algorithm is just telling me about women in their thirties who are now being diagnosed with ADHD. <laughs> and I realized it was when I, I had my child. And so I had this, like, you know, I was a super high achieving tech woman and I had all these things going for me. And then I got pregnant and I was so beautiful because I got to slow down and really focus on myself and be creative. And then the addition of this one responsibility, I was so hyper-focused on being a mother, but I felt like it was hard for me to manage everything else. And it kind of remember, reminded me of that moment in university where I was like, oh, interesting. It's like that same kind of pattern again. So I went to my family doctor who's young and art like my age and he's just so he's so validating even if he's like no you don't have that like he's just so validating so I booked an appointment with him and he's like I just sent him a note before and he was like okay what do you want to talk about I was like okay maybe I'm too online like mm -hmm. I don't know if you watch succession but like my favorite line I mean there's so many lines but one of my favorite lines from succession is when um Ken is saying to his wife like you're too online when she wants to get out of the city the day yeah. of the funeral or the yeah. memorial or whatever. And I was like, Oh, that's so me. So I'm like, Oh, I'm like too online. I know I've probably watched too many like TikToks or my algorithm is coming to me, but like, I think I have ADHD and he's like, okay. And he asked me like the three to five questions that like your GP is supposed to ask you. And yeah. like after the third one, he's like, okay, 
so yeah, I think you do have ADHD. And I was like, oh shit. Like I almost went into it being like, you know, I'm sure he's going to play that same doctor role where they are like, no, you're fine. You know, just yeah. go home and like, sleep or something. Cause like, that's how it is with like most things. Right. And that's what you hear about online where like, oh, my doctor didn't listen to me. Like I had these fibroids and my doctor didn't listen to me. And then I had to go do this. So I'm like going into it thinking I'm going to be like so invalidated. And he was like, no, you, you have to go get tested. And I was like, oh shit. So he had, you know, the, the more lo-fi test that I could do. And then there was like the online version. And then he was like, there's a couple clinics in Toronto that specialize in ADHD, but it's like way more rigorous testing. So it's like, you know, the three or four days where you go through like EQ and IQ and all the things. And I was like, no, I want to do that one. Cause I just, this is like, I'm 37 years old. Like I just have to figure this out now. Right. Yeah. And so I went through it and it was really interesting. And then yes, I did have ADHD. How did you take that? I mean, it's great that the doctor validated you because yeah, this is what I see on all Instagram stories everywhere for everything where the doctor doesn't do anything and then you just have to go and do more, get more reports or like fly somewhere else and get things done. And then that's when you realize. So that sounds like a good doctor. Yeah, he's a really good doctor. I'm so lucky. I'm like, please never leave. Like he went on path <laughs> for a little bit and I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was good. I mean, you asked me like how I felt with the diagnosis. Yeah. It was so validating. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I've, I've heard of people who have that grieving process of like what could have been, but I didn't really have that. Like I had more of a, okay, like so many things make sense. And I think when you're a woman, especially when you're a South Asian woman, you have a lot of shame of not being organized your yep. room not being clean all the time when you're younger, you know, like you're not ha having your makeup on all the time. You're not being like, you're sh basically there's so much sh like shame in your shit not being together. Yeah. And I think when you have ADHD, that's kind of like your norm, right? Like, and so, you know, I, I have a lovely mother, but she's very direct and she's so organized and she would always be like, why is your room so messy? Or like, you know, the, the, the off handed comments that like a very progressive mother, like I have will still make, which is like, you know, like, oh, you're a girl, you know, your room should be beautiful. Or like a lot of that was just validated. It was like, okay, it wasn't, it's not just like something wrong with me. It's like, actually, there's something going on here. So I think that kind of like shame and guilt and blame came off my shoulders. And I feel like I've been freer ever since. And I, I, I'm probably that annoying person who says, hey, listen, I have ADHD. Like I say that in a lot of conversations, just so I can set expectations. Because I think a lot of people expect me to have like everything in order and like that's I'm a creative person like that's not how my brain works and I think that there are so many beautiful parts of me that I love even more now I'm not hiding them anymore I'm just like actually like having hyper focus or being really creative or being able to focus on multiple different things and sounds and stuff and like get in a lot of information and be obsessive about like learning and going down rabbit holes has actually helped me be successful and you know really awesome people lack executive function it's okay <laughs> like um so yeah it's kind of like helped me yeah just love myself more which i i always struggle with i love how you've embraced your diagnosis and it's helped you actually be your truer self than what you were maybe before you even found out so yeah it's, like it's kind of like you know when people find out they have autism they start they <laughs> figure out how to remove their mask i'm sure i'm like somewhat on the spectrum but I think with ADHD, it's been really nice to like start to remove the mask a little bit more and be okay with that. And I think there's so much shame with it when you're a South Asian woman, like even as a, as a mom, mm -hmm. I find there's this really good content creator. She was talking about, um, she's non-South Asian, but she was talking about almost the guilt that you feel as a woman and a mother who has ADHD, because sometimes your husband is the one who is kind of the more organized one. And yeah. you feel really guilty because in a lot of your mom friend groups or, you know, the wives groups, they're always complaining about their husband being messy or their husband forgetting this or and I'm like, oh, my husband is like so awesome. Like he's kind of the backbone of like our life. Like yeah. I call him like the EA of the family. Like he books travel and like, 
you know what I mean? Like he's the organized one. And like, obviously I have like big vision and can do the things, but I did, I do sometimes feel like, you know, guilt around that where like, oh, I feel like, you know, my husband remember the water bottle today before my son's being dropped off at Montessori. Um, And I'm like, oh, did he put it in the water bottle? And it's like, you know, you see reels and content about the wife always complaining that the husband is forgetting the water bottle. Right. So yeah, I think there's shame still there for me, but I'm, I'm trying to learn how to deal with it. I also think this is equality because it's great that even the husband is remembering all of these things. I feel like there should be reels about that. He's like super dad. And so kind of like the way he took care of like me in our relationship is like how he approaches taking care of our family. And I think because I don't micromanage him, mm-hmm. like I think a lot of uh, a lot of my friends like have like trust I mean, rightfully so, must have trust issues with like their husbands doing things. But I just, maybe it's the ADHD, but like I didn't even have time to like worry about how he's putting on a diaper. It's like he just has to put on the diaper, right? And so because of the lack of micromanagement from my end, like he is that ideal equal partner. I mean, like he's still a man, right? So they're not yeah. equal, but like, but as like as equal of a, of a parent um, that he can, that be, he can be. No, that's great. I mean, you embracing this is making me realize how I should embrace my anxiety as well. Like, I've been a mental health advocate for what the past few years but I still myself internally like find some shame in acknowledging that or like things that I miss out on because I might be anxious about being out and meeting some people or going to a conference and not being able to get out there. You're making me think a lot about how I should learn to embrace it better. Probably this is yeah. not be confusing. Okay. Do you want to go back to childhood, Arte? Is there anything else that she... So she went to art school and she loved doing that. And after that, what was what were her next steps? Yeah, I actually... It's funny. When I got to art school, I didn't like art anymore. <laughs> okay. And I think that's like... I think that's an ADHD thing a little bit because it's yeah. something that is like you have to learn it in a very specific way right and I I think it like kind of sucked the joy out of it for me yeah so I didn't pursue art I mean I I I take classes here and there and still engage in things and I I'm building an art collection and I love to do that but I ended up doing a poli sci degree so then how did you enter the Shopify and e-commerce and marketing stuff from there I was very into politics I was in policy I was like I moved to Ottawa which is like our DC I used to be obsessed with the West Wing I still kind of am and so I moved to Ottawa thinking you know I'm gonna be like CJ Craig and I'm gonna be like doing all this calm stuff and I hated it like it was it was amazing it was really great to learn but I felt like government moved so slow and Mm -hmm. I was so interested in like what is the future of communications and Twitter was just exploding and there was politicians on Twitter and I remember when I used to talk to politicians in Ottawa I'd be like what is your what are you talking about on Twitter like you don't even have a handle yet like what's what's going on. And so I found myself really excited about how technology was changing, like the way that we relate maybe. And Mm -hmm. so I hated that world. I moved back to Toronto and I started to go to a lot of like the startup events, which in Toronto back in like 2010, I would suppose was very tiny. Like Mm -hmm. our tech community was so small. You could fit everybody in like a pub (laughs) Um, there was like a couple like demo events that would happen and and so I joined a company called Jet Cooper because I met the the guys on Twitter and I they would do these things called lean coffee and they had this cool name called Jet Cooper so I ended up going to TEDx Toronto the summer I moved back and I and I met now my current husband and he was the founder of Jet Cooper and I was like what do you do like what is what is this thing and turns out they were a digital studio focused on like designing and and kind of bringing people's obscure tech ideas to how do we design this for mobile at the time or how do we make this like more user uh, friendly so we were kind of a really small studio that was focused on ux our office was where a lot of events happened so i remember i met now my current husband and his co-founder and i was like what do you do and they're like what do you do i'm like well i might just go get a policy job in toronto or something and i was like i really like you know project management and I love what's happening on the intersection of like the old world and the new world and they were like you should come work for us I was like doing what (laughs) like what would I do they're like well you know we make websites and mobile apps I'm like I don't want to set up a WordPress like site like what do you mean 
and uh, had a bunch of meetings with them. I remember when I first came to the office, the outside of the our office was painted in chalkboard and like everyone in Toronto had like at that time it was very small had like signed with their Twitter handle and I'm like oh these are my people like I just felt at home even yeah. though I wasn't you know a developer or a designer or anything I just felt like I was at home and so I took the risk I remember my parents were like what are you doing like <laughs> you're actually very good at I was like on TV talking about politics and oh, I like wow. then joined this and my parents were like what are you doing like this is so risky and I was like no I'm gonna do this like I think this is correct. And so I joined as like kind of in the middle of my husband was doing our sales and our business development and getting clients. And then our co-founder, who's now one of my best friends, was he's our creative director. And so he was building the design practice and we just we went up to front end development. And so he was building that team. And so I was in the middle and my job was ops and community and kind of building like, how do we want to grow this business? And then we grew that like for four years and then we were one of Shopify's first acquisitions in the city oh, wow. so, yeah that's how I got to Shopify yeah that journey is so interesting I never I, I feel like I follow you since like a few years on socials and I did not know that was your journey of like getting into the yeah. world of e-commerce I don't I'm not really good at social like I mean I I think I use social like elder millennials use Facebook like I I think I still use it like uh going about my day or like my thoughts and feelings um and lately it's just been a lot of like style and stuff because I feel like I'm expressing myself through style now especially after the ADHD diagnosis I feel more free express myself but yeah I just yeah I also hate LinkedIn so I feel like for professional stuff like no one I don't really talk about so then you started working at Shopify and then how did you get into creating backbone angels and yeah. into angel investing from there? I think, listen, like you, you're you in the heart of the tech companies, right? And that culture and that ecosystem that's had a really long time to develop. I worked at Shopify for about seven and a half years, almost eight years. And it was just such an amazing wild ride. And we don't get a lot of those rocket ship growth kind of companies in in. Canada, let alone like, you know, in Toronto. And so it was a really, really amazing time. But me and my nine friends who happened to be women who all of us were in different parts of Shopify feeling like, you know, we had helped and were a part of the growth, we felt like we needed to give back to our ecosystem now, which is very similar to like, you know, everyone who worked at Facebook early on or PayPal early on or any of those success stories you'll see that a lot in the Valley. And that's why there's such a good flywheel of like, you work somewhere, you, you know, obviously have a windfall, but you have a really like an amazing background and experience. And then those are the same people who mentor and invest in, you know, new founders. And then that like just creates this amazing flywheel, right? Which is, it's had for a while now, but we don't necessarily have that same momentum here. And so for us, It was, how do we bring that to Canada? How do we bring that to our local ecosystems? And then how do we also just, you know, fund and back the the founders that we want to see in the future? And so much of that was a lot of our guy friends at Shopify, even my husband, they were getting decks from like early on, or they were being asked to write an angel check early on. And we found we were getting a lot of requests for mentorship or like speaking on panels or coming into like talking about women in tech but not necessarily won the opportunity to put money in. And so that was something that obviously just irked us and we knew we could do it, but we wanted to do it for for the founders that we wanted to see in the future, right? The, the founders that when you Google a, a startup founder, it's not just like, you know, a guy in a hoodie, it's someone who looks like me and you. So we built Backbone Angels, which invests in women, people of color, minority founders that we feel, you know, a lot of the times they're being overlooked or it's obvious harder for them to to raise my investing journey is really interesting so my husband and I obviously I met when we were building our agency we got married when we were at Shopify and we both experienced a windfall he immediately started investing in startups or he was getting opportunities to or he was like you know I'm gonna put I'm gonna write a 10k check into this company and for me I thought that was ludicrous I was like this is 
our friend <laughs> like um or it was you know we don't know where this is gonna go and so he would invest his money and i was like i, I want to do other things with my money i want to be safer i want to make sure my family's settled i want to be more creative and a couple of years after us doing that kind of like you know kind of dividing and conquering with our finances i realized our angel portfolio and our alternatives portfolio didn't really match exactly what we felt like we stood for. We're both South Asian leaders in the community. And I said, a lot of this is not, um, yeah, a lot of the founders are, are not necessarily resembling the things that we talk about, which is we talk about diversity. We talk about um, backing like specific communities in the city. And for me, it's like, I talk about women all the time and we yeah. barely had any women in our portfolio. And so my husband, rightfully so, he said, listen, this is what happens when you are passively doing something. And when it's just an inbound strategy, right? We don't, he's like, we don't actually have anything outwardly where we are going out and connecting with founders that we care about, or we're actively saying that, Hey, we're angel investing forget angel investing in like women. We were just, we weren't even saying we were angel investing. So this is what happens when you're passive about something. And he's like, if you want to do this, I suggest build out what your thesis is and go out and tell people. So I did that. Um, I was like fired up. And so I started telling people that, Hey, this is what we're doing. This is like the types of founders that we want to invest in. I will say for the first six months, we did start investing in a lot of women, but they were a lot of our friends one. And a lot of them were white women who I love. And I love the companies that they've started. But I said to my husband, I'm like, this is really interesting when it comes to, you know, maybe like, are we not specific enough? And he was like, I think we have to be specific. I think we have to say we want to invest in people of color as well. And um, we did some like A-B testing on our language. And just obviously I started meeting the right communities and, and going out there and saying that I want to do this. And since then, I think we've invested. We're now at over, I think we're over 60 companies now that we've invested oh, in. And I want to say. Yeah, and over 50% of, of our portfolio is women, which is amazing. That is amazing. And then you started investing in women of color as well. Like, yeah, about. yeah, exactly. And and then, you know, we I had been investing for a couple of years. And then when I left back, uh, when I left Shopify three years ago is when um, we started Backbone Angels, which is great because now it's like a, a community and a pool of us that are, are getting to meet a lot of women who are doing really interesting things in different industries. What is it that is closest to your heart about this? I don't like gender deterministic statements. So I don't like saying that like women are better leaders, right? Or like, oh, if women just ran the world, we would be a better place. Because I think the system has elevated certain traits that like women and men take on, right? And I've been in those positions before too, where I felt like I had to be a certain type of person. And I, I find I am slightly more you know, maybe it's the ADHD. I'm like more straightforward. I feel like I kind of have more of those like male traits, I'm more aggressive. I don't like saying that like, because you're a woman, you're better. And I have made so many mistakes as a leader where I'm like, no, like it's actually so much of it is internalized. But I do think having the right perspectives at the table and making your table more diverse is inherently going to make whatever you are doing better. And that doesn't mean that like decisions need to be made by committee. It's just that it's the same way of like, you read more, you write better, right? Like yeah. you understand the market that you're entering because you've done your research, you will inherently develop better products. You have more diverse voices at the table when you're building products, you're going to be able to reach more customers and a broader audience, right? So that's, that's my like perspective on making sure we have the right voices at the table. But one of the things I'm really passionate about is we're not going to be able to dismantle the traits that we think make a really good leader unless we do have more women at the table, right? Like we aren't going to be able to figure out how to build a better society with like 50% of the population not having a chance to participate, right? Or they have a chance to participate, but they get like cut off at a certain ceiling or you know when they decide to have kids they're not as involved in in the corporate world and then when they want to come back it's like it's harder right and so for me i'm just i i don't know i i think i think it's just bad business to leave 50 percent of the population outside of the ability to come build something with you um and so that's what i'm really passionate about i also 
I, I don't take for granted the fact that, you know, I had a father who was really obsessed with talking about women in leadership. So he would always talk about, you know, these, he has this one story where we would talk about these two young girls who were in school with him and they were so much better at math than him and like you couldn't beat them. And so he would always share examples like that or he would talk about like women leaders or women political leaders. We would watch the news together. He would talk about women leaders who are in corporate worlds and he just just he was hell bent on showing me and my sister examples because he's like if they don't see examples they're not going to think they can do that they're going to think their job is this right or their life is this and like that doesn't mean that my parents didn't teach me how to cook right like my my dad loves to cook he actually cooks the ghee that like you know we use for glee oh, so what? Yeah, 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 yeah. He was in um, uh, cosmetic pharmaceuticals for his whole career. And so he developed this whole like thing and he works with our lab and all the things for like this like skincare grade ghee, which um, he's very obsessed about. So yeah, so for me, it's like I was always shown the power of representation which made me feel like I could do whatever I wanted to right it wasn't until I older where when I, when I was older where I started to realize oh there are barriers like I think I was like in my Delulu era for like so long that like young naive I felt like I could do anything which I would love to get back to a little bit of that delusion but I think I just I learned the power of representation really early on and so for me I might get annoyed about posting on Instagram or like showing up again to a podcast like this, but I'm like, I I feel like if I can inspire one young woman to just be who she is and talk about something like ADHD openly, but also talk about technology openly, like maybe I'm doing my job and that's it. You are. By being here, you're like inspiring (laughs) me (laughs) to continue doing this and a lot of others will be listening to this, but What you said about your dad showing you how representation matters since childhood is amazing because let's face it, I don't think in a lot of South Asian communities, we still have that representation be so common. As a mother, how do you think getting back to work has been or just your general notion of women around you? Like, does motherhood actually hinder your success in any way? That's really complicated. Motherhood and postpartum is Mm -hmm. so different for every woman. And how you react to like all these hormones in your body is so varied across the board. How your support system, like your partner or your family or your friends, your neighbors, etc., show up for you is so varied. And if your baby has colic or not, right? And so I think, I feel like everyone's journey is so unique that it's hard to say, you know, I had such a great experience with like having this child. It was, to be honest, exactly what I needed. I, I don't think I tapped into the part of me that like loved and was happy and was playful and was childlike and liked art in a very long time. And my son Kabir brought out, I feel all of those parts of me that I had neglected and I wasn't ready to tap into, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to say that because having Kabir made me more motivated. I actually quit my job. So I went, so, I mean, the other thing is, is I live in Canada, I'm Canadian. Our mat leave system is so great. You don't have to go back to six weeks or whatever you have in the US, right? And I know you're in the Valley, so all the companies have a different, like, you know, it's a little bit different from the rest of the US. But for me, like, I had, I technically have a lot, almost like a year and a half off, right? My husband has like four months off, right? And he's like a leader and he wanted to make the example of men should take time off. So, he was off for like three to four months and he took them off right away. I took off eight months and then I decided to go back to work because we were going through this big reorg and my boss was like, come back. It'll be great. We can just figure out what you want to do. And so I came back for like at least like four or five months, but I just, I felt like I had just so much support. And I think that's a lot of the things that we don't talk about in tech. Like Mm -hmm. we often focus because we're so focused on like our ecosystem and our sector and how can we make it better that we 
almost fall into this trap of like forgetting what the rest of the world is like. And like, even in Canada, when mat leave is so great, I know it's so hard for people because you're not making the same amount of money and you have to go back to work faster or you have to make a lot of compromises. But when you're in tech, like my husband, who's like a VP at Shopify, took off four months. Like, and he didn't, a lot of, a lot of our guy friends will take it off after. So when the wife is going back to work, then they'll take the time off. But I was like, no, I need you. Like, I cannot do this by myself. So we were in that bubble together. And so I want to say it brought out like the part of me that wanted to go back and build and create and actually like was very excited about entrepreneurship and building our family office and doing the things that we wanted to do because I was so motivated. I, I don't I don't think that's that's normal. <sighs> I will say, you know, so many of the amazing women that we see who are founders like 40 plus did start thinking about doing their own thing when they were on mat leave or once they had children, whether it was like they never want to go back to that world again, or mm -hmm. it gave them more flexibility in terms of their time. Or frankly, they were just like, I don't know, after going through childbirth, I'm like, I can do anything like I can't just like, <laughs> I don't want to just like, I love Toby. Like I love Shopify. I love the mission. I would not leave for anything other than I want to do what I did for Shopify for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I had no reason to leave. Like, sure. Every company has struggles and challenges and you're trying to grow as a leader. But for me, it was like, I want to go bet on myself. And I don't know if that's the norm when you have a child, because I think it's just so different. It's like my hormones could have reacted completely differently. I could have been in postpartum depression for six months, which, you know, mm -hmm. I had a little bit of those baby blues. And then I could say it does change everything. I will say it makes a lot of things harder and it made me a better leader. Like I remember when I came back to work, I had to apologize to people being like, I can't believe I used to book meetings this late, or I can't believe, you know, our social hangs were dinner time. Like I want to get home to make sure, I mean, I was during COVID, so we were all home, but like, I would want to come home for bath time and bedtime. Like, why didn't you give me this feedback? I was like, why wouldn't you say anything? And so I think in some respects it does. Yeah. It, I think it changes things because you can't be that same, you know, I can do whatever I want for my career and job, but in other respects, it makes you really good at time management because it is at the end of the day, like a job and you, you have to prioritize other things, especially for me, who's someone who's like so all consuming. Like, I'm just like, my job is my identity or my career is my identity. And so yeah. having Kabir actually made me more diligent about my time, which was nice. My husband and I joke, so we got married a year ago and he's like, we're so involved in tech and being in this valley and this bubble. I think the only thing that will help us understand our own identity or like appreciate life will be that whenever we get a child, because then we'll understand that there's something more to life. I, I guess we haven't touched on the founder journey, which you like started after experiencing motherhood. So talk more about Glee. I never wanted to run my own business. It always felt really daunting. I like the idea of working for people and being very entrepreneurial at work. That's like the best part about working at a, a young startup is like you can kind of be in that entrepreneur seat um, without like the same level of risk, but yeah. you can kind of come up with ideas and be really agile and do the things that you can if you're building your own business. I think where I got the entrepreneurial bug was working at Shopify, where you just meet all these wonderful people who are building these cool businesses or people who are just coming up with like the best product ideas or you know, they're like, I'm going to start a retail store and I'm going to sell these things. And I'm like, oh, I want to be that. And so I always had like so many ideas. I'm that like really annoying tech person who always has like a million domains. So yeah, that I think at Shopify, I was like, oh, I could start my own business. And then nothing was interesting enough or nothing was something that I followed through on. And I, I do have some of those ideas that maybe I'll tackle one day. But my brother is the brains behind Ghee and like using Ghee for skincare. So that's how we, we came up with Glee is he had this like epiphany. He had really chapped lips since he was younger. So we're four siblings. I'm the eldest. He's the youngest. And we have two in the middle. Both of them are in tech as well. And big so, family. yeah, it's a big family. It's a group of four. And I'm the eldest. So like take all you want about like eldest daughter, all the yeah. problems. <laughs> yeah. So he was like, 
my lips are so chopped all the time. Since he was a kid, he was like stealing our lip balm, all the different brands, trying to make it work. And him and I got really chopped lips, both of us. The irony of having a, like a lip balm company is like, sometimes my lips get so bad and I'm like, oh, constantly like figuring out what to do with them. And so my mom would always say, put ghee on your lips, put ghee on your skin. Like we used to, you know, in the village, like your daddy used to like mix clove in and rub it on her elbows and her muscle ache. And so we heard this growing up, but he is the youngest of four and was like very rebellious and was like, why would I, I'm not going to use that. And so around four years, five years ago now, it was like a really bad Canadian winter. Like it was one of those like mm -hmm. minus 40, everyone's cold and his lips were chopped again. And my mom was like, Ski. and so he was like in the kitchen so he put a little ghee on and he's like what is happening he's like why is this so good he's like it's a little bit more absorbent than coconut oil which kind of just stays on your skin I love coconut oil but like it's a little bit different he's like it just he's like there's something really beautiful about this and my sister and I so my sister's like a health science person she's like very scientific when it comes to her skincare she has a flare-up she has like a 12-step process she's very like ingredient focused so she's like a little bit of a skincare like nut and then mm -hmm. I on the other hand um love to buy new products and try new products and I invest in a lot of skincare brands too six months later he comes to us with a lip balm that he's made and he bought the ingredients he bought the burners and everything he's done all his research on how to make lip balm he's done his research on ghee realized no one's used it for cosmetic other than like in ayurveda text and ayurvedic practitioners will use like just straight up ghee but no one has brought it to skincare and so yeah then he started working with a lab and he came to us with this lip balm he came to his fiance first and then he shared it with us and we were like oh this is good this is like really good and he's like i think i'm gonna do this i'm like you have to do this and i i think it was i was like so pregnant at the time too i was like you have to do this this is so amazing and he's like, oh my God, do you want to help me? I'm like, sure. Yeah. Like we all kind of helped him. Like my sister did a lot of like the ingredient stuff with him. And my dad and mom were like trying to figure out like different filtration ways of making like clean ghee and all this type of stuff. And, and I came up with the name Glee just as like an offhand, like, oh, it kind of makes me happy. Like ghee makes you happy. Right. I'm like, yeah. it's almost like kind of like naughty to put like extra ghee in your doll or like my mother-in-law will always laugh at me. She's like, are you putting sog in the ghee or ghee in the sog? Like, what is this ratio? <laughs> situation going on right now and yeah. so we were like we need to take this to market so we actually launched well he launched the company when i my son was one month old oh wow and so we launched the company we were like taking photos ourselves and we wanted to test it out with certain markets so we tested it out with like young south asian women south asian makeup artists a lot of our friends and family and the non-south asian community that was like very into wellness and like lo and behold people loved our first product they were obsessed with it they were like the repurchasing was really high. And from like an e-com standpoint, even though like our sales weren't incredibly high, I was looking at the repurchase rate and I was like, okay, this is really interesting. Like returning customer is such a good indicator for like possible e-com success. So we just invested more time and effort into the business. We spent almost two years going back to the drawing board on a formula making sure it was shelf stable, but also bringing ghee to the future. Like our whole point was we don't want to just either sell ghee and we don't want to be so fixated on just Ayurveda. Like there's been so much innovation in skincare, so many cool ingredients. How do we pair the right things with ghee to increase its efficacy for the solution we are trying to create, right? Or like mm -hmm. the problem that we're trying to solve. And so our product is 12 months shelf stable, which is actually more than a lot of skincare, even though ours mm -hmm. has gain it. Uh, and then last May, we relaunched in a big way with our new packaging and lots more inventory and not just our lip balms. But we have a lip mask and a lip scrub, and now we're coming out with more body products. So that's Ooh, our key journey. That's very interesting. And I love how wholesome it is when you said it's all because of all the sibling love and Mm. the fact that it's because everyone's trying to take care of each other and that's yeah. for you so it's, it's a beautiful story but that sounds very exciting i'm excited for glee's next products we've almost covered everything but to get to the main crux of the podcast which is mental health so you've spoken about your adhd diagnosis how do you just manage your own mental health at the moment what do you do for yourself that makes yeah. you feel alive i don't do it alone anymore. I think there were so many years where I felt like my mental health was 
just my responsibility or like I had to do all of the things by myself and I, I'm not, you know, like I said, I'm an elder sister. It's really hard for me to accept help or ask for help. And so for me, the big epiphany in the last couple of years is I can't do it alone. And I made this joke with friends last year. It was like, I'm very into niche therapist this year. Like, like I have a, my, you know, I have an ADHD coach. And so that was kind of interesting to like experiment with. And then I have a professional coach and then I have like a therapist for like just every day and obviously incredibly privileged. Cause like I can access those things um, or those like people and support systems. But for me, I'm like, I don't have to do it alone. And I, it's on me to like go out and seek the type of help that I feel like I need or almost like a partnership for the things that I want to build. And it's kind of like that quote where, you know, or it, there's like that really great piece of advice, which is like, you need your own board, right? Mm -hmm. For your career and your life and your professional world. It's like, you need your own board, right? You need your, you need like a mentor. You need someone who's a peer. Or you need someone in the same industry. You need someone not in the same industry. And it's like that kind of system and your mentors help you with your professional life. But then how do you build something like that for your whole life? One thing that I loved about working at Shopify is I discovered professional coaching and professional mm -hmm. coaching has helped me through so many interesting career challenges. And so why not apply that same thing for, for life? And you can't go and dump a lot of that stuff to your friends and family, right? Like no one wants trauma dumping. Like everyone can't be there for you. Everyone's going through their own shit. And so if you can access help, why not through a professional whose job it is, who's studied it? Um, that's that's how I tackle my mental health. The other thing that I think I'm really consistent about is I do yoga. And so much of it is not the, the North American sense of yoga. It's not like to get really skinny or to burn weight or just try to be Zen at the end of the class. Yeah. So for me, I, I think, I think exercise, but specifically yoga and like low impact stuff for me has been really important. I actually found some of the high impact stuff was stressing me out even more. And so I think you, I think you need that mind body connection. If you're going to try to tackle, tackle your mental health, you can't put either thing in like separate buckets because we're one body and we forget that. I did not ask you the segue question, which is auntie wants to know. So this is where we talk about the most peculiar question an auntie has asked you and you've been confused by it. I remember when I was at art school, there was a lot of like, what are you going to do with that? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. My sister gets the brunt of the auntie questions. Yeah, she gets the brunt of the auntie questions. I think I'm a little intimidating. I mean, I have gotten like, oh, are you having a second child? You know, those mm -hmm. like typical things. But I don't, I, I'm someone who's like also going through IVF. And I, I don't let those things bother me because I'm like, you, you have your, like, maybe it's malicious. Maybe it's coming from a place of care, but it's also coming out from a place of like complete ignorance. Where I'm like, yeah, this was a very... Amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Aarti. I had so much fun and it was incredible having you on. Thank you so much for having me. And it's just so wonderful seeing South Asian women building something in the mental health space. I think even though, you know, we, you and I talk so much about how far we've come, I think so many things, especially beyond just, you know, talk therapy or some of those remedies are still so taboo, right? And like, you know, I have ADHD, but I think about the stigma around other mental health issues that, you know, are so prevalent within our community. So I was just as inspired by you. Thank you.